Richard Stern. This was your first feature film, but you already had made a 45 minute long film called Inside the Expanding Universe in 1985, and that was of a bit of a similar world as well concerning issues within the genre of post-apocalyptic science fiction. Can you tell a little bit about the connection between that one and hardware, or is there any? Yeah, I made a, actually a very long Super 8 movie when I was still in South Africa, it was called Incidents in an Expanding Universe, and it was more than an hour long, almost feature length on um, Super 8, which um, concerns these same doomed characters slouching around their apartment on Christmas Eve, with um, Shades, the tripping next door neighbor, and um, the different characters in the block. But it was more like um, a cross between Fat City, the John Huston movie, and um, yeah, a book by Harry Harrison called Make Room, Make Room, the book that Silent Green is based on. But it was not an action movie. And then I put out a script based on this for uh, many years and no one was interested. And everyone said the same thing, which is to try and make it more like Terminator or Alien. So um, after a while I put on um, an Iron Maiden record and I sat down and I put a, a Hunter Killer war droid into the apartment and um, rewrote the movie to make it into a monster movie. <laughs> you had done several music videos before directing that one, and this has a lot of imaginary that somehow resembles music videos of that time. Is there a clear visual connection between the stuff you did in the field of music videos and planning hardware? Well, um, Carl McCoy is kind of playing the devil in all of them or um, some version of the devil. Certainly in the field of the Nephilim videos and um, hardware, they belong to a very similar world. We see um, similar images like the metallic prosthetic hand bursting out of the ground and stuff. So I think it grew very spontaneously out of that, in that um, the finances, Miramax, and the people who put up the money, which was not very much, 800,000 pounds, just under one million, um, could see from the music videos um, what we were capable of and believe that we could actually shoot the movie. Questions from the audience, please raise your hand. There, uh, in the back. Uh, one question that has been concerning me like uh, around uh, 30 years, so I'm more a right fan, so how did you get Lenny on the movie and what was the idea behind that? Well, originally the taxi driver character was going to be a bit more like Tank Girl, so she went to Sinead O'Connor, but um, <laughs> she was in her bold phase at that time. And in the last minute, Sinead couldn't make it, so Lemmy was in fact a standard and a substitute for Sinead O'Connor, which was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he did it for a bottle of Shaq Daniels. <laughs> Thank you. More questions? Hello. Yeah, he is a dictator character that we were using in a lot of the music videos at the time. Um, I'm assuming that um, the country they're living in has become extremely right-wing. Yeah, and one of the things that I'm interested in about the hardware world is that all the characters work for the government. Um, Mo is kind of working for the military and Jill is on welfare. And uh, there, there are no real rebels. They're all um, a little um, right-wing. And I imagine that yeah, it's, it's some kind of... Um, Fascist dictator on the rise. Thank you. All questions? Ulahala. <laughs> uh, well, one of the big inspirations for hardware um, it was stage fright which is by Miguel Suave, which is an Italian horror film all set in one theater. This and also Demons, that are produced by Dario Argento, are made by Lamberto Barber, which is all set in one cinema. 
So from seeing these movies, I could see it was possible to make a low-budget um, horror movie, provided the characters were locked in one location. And Stage Fright and Demons 2 are scored by um, Simon Boswell, which is where I first heard his music. And um, I guess I was too shy and um, we maybe did not have enough money to go up to Goblin or Claudio Simonetti, so um, I went up to Simon. You mentioned the other day that there's a sort of Italian connection behind the fat peeping Tom character as well that uh, traces back to Antonio Margarita's film Killer Fish. Can you tell more about this connection? Well, Harper is full of different exploitation references, but um, the Lincoln Weinberg Jr., the um, large, obnoxious character, um, is partially inspired by an Antonio Margaretti movie called Killer Fish, which is a piranha movie. Um, there's a similarly large, kind of unctuous character in it, and um, I remember when I saw that movie, I, I was waiting for this character to fall in the water and get eaten by piranhas the whole way through. And I thought by having this character in the movie, then the audience will stick around and wait because they know something bad is going to happen to them. <laughs> there has been a lot of legal battles with the rights with these films, and they're still going on. And you also <laughs> mentioned that we could see you back on the topic hopefully with a TV series with a company called CBS. Can you tell where that project is going right now? Well, it's premature to say, but there is talk of a hardware TV series. It depends if we are able to finally extract the rights. I'm in a devil's deal with people who are trying to um, develop hardware as a TV show because um, I'm using their legal department to try and extricate the rights from um, Miramax and Buena Vista, who have controlled the movie ever since we made it. For 25 years, we have not been able to do a sequel, and I have not been able to return to the hardware world. But there are many things about the, um, the movie that I would like to put into further detail. So um, for years, I have dreamed of a sequel. Also, um, drone soldiers are coming. I mean, they're uh, closer now than they were a few years ago. For I'm um, sure they're working on things which are going to be very similar to the Mark 13 cyborg that will run on legs like Big Dog and some of the things being developed by DARPA and the people in the US. And I suspect in another um, 10, 15 years we will actually have something like this. I mean, it was since hardware about five years ago, I remember seeing a um, footage on the television of a um, the alleged suicide bomber who had been shot in in the um, contained the wall between Israel and Palestine by a what they described as a mine clear, a British mine clearing droid that had been modified by the Israelis to be weaponized so that it had like guns on it and um, remote control eyes. But I think here we are maybe um, 15 years at best away from um, actual um, drone soldiers. So I, I would like to return to the subject. Do you already have written material that you could use if you are able to get back with it? Yeah, no, a considerable amount. You'll be surprised, but yeah, um, I imagine that in future um, droids would be capable of auto-independent action um, and making their own choices, but obviously you could, you could also override them and you would have um, droid operators working at a distance, maybe 300 kilometers away, and one droid operator might be running um, maybe five, ten different um, units at once, and also probably checking their um, Facebook um, likes and um, <laughs> going on eBay at the, at the same time. So I, I wanted to examine how um, you could be a war criminal in, under these <laughs> circumstances and to show how um, yeah, drone soldiers probably will be deployed um, in much the same way that people operate yeah, drone aircraft now. There is a, um, a disconnect or lack of responsibility when you're you have drones involved. Uh, five minutes still the next. Oh, okay. Last question from there. Mm -hmm. As an Please. artist um, in your past with your films, which one of you are, are you most proud of and why? Oh, I, you know, you can't say that. It's like saying, which one of your children do you love the most? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it depends on what day and, you know, how they're behaving. Um, 
Um, and they've, they've all been incredibly steep learning curves. I mean, the first one, hardware, was almost impossible and uh, a complete fluke. And then Dust Devil, I thought, was the worst thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> and, um, and so it's been generally each one is worse than the last. <laughs> I'd like to ask about the influence of the 2000 AD comics that had on your film. Uh, did you get any designs from the cartoonists of that magazine on how, how was the uh, story uh, involved in your creating this world of hardware? You know, I do have a cousin in common with 2000 AD who drew under the name of um, Mike McMahon, um, who drew on the, early, the first 10 years or so of the um, Judge Dredd strip which includes the, um, the other Cursed Earth series section. Mm. So, um, yeah, this very much comes out of the same place, but all of this is also coming from um, the immediate influences that came before. Um, there's a, um, a comic strip called The Long Tomorrow by Dan O'Bannon, which I think is the first one that really visualizes what um, we'd now think of from 2000 AD as um, Mega City One. Um, and, um, Really, the roots of hardware came from yeah, Harry Harrison, um, Make Room, Make Room, and also from um, Roger Zelazny from um, a book called Damnation Alley. Um, Damnation, I don't know if you've ever come across these books, but Damnation Alley is a story where a, the last Hell's Angel in America, um, who's called Hell, is captured and is given an option of either being terminated or sent on a mission into New York, which is like Mega City 2 on the other side of the coast. It's the story that um, Judge Dredd and Escape from New York are, um, are totally ripping off. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I read these as a, as a teenager, so they're all, they're all part of the mix. Mm -hmm. And I'm fortunate to have some of the original 2000 AD art hidden behind my cupboard back home, which I will mm -hmm. maybe retire on one day. Okay. Well, that's the very last one. If we <laughs> Please. Our major good vibes was legalized marijuana, but it's also government monopoly. Um, I imagine maybe tobacco is illegal in this world. The, the legalized government monopoly marijuana is one of hardware's good guesses, because that seems to actually have come true. But yeah, I, and yeah, Jill is basically stoned the entire way through, and, um, which is one of the reasons why she survives, of course. And, um, she also uses the marijuana packets as a, as a weapon to uh, to blow up the droid at one point. I think the same with Shades. Shades is tripping, so he's much more relaxed and it's also able to somehow come through. Yeah, and I, I think it definitely helps to be tripping or drunk in, in the midst of an um, extreme crisis or disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you're great.